<laughs> so in these last weeks, we've been going through the book of Acts. And we started with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. It came upon the church and uh, the church was growing rapidly uh, through the power uh, of the Holy Spirit. And then the devil attacked. His strategy was to attack with physical violence. He tried to crush the church with persecution. The apostles were threatened and flogged, put in jail. And when that failed, he tried to destroy the church from inside through Ananias and Sapphira who lied to the Holy Spirit. Today we're going to do chapter 6, <clears throat> and we can see the devil's next attack was the cleverest of the three. So I'm just going to read from chapter 6, from 1 to 7. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because the widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Pocorus, I don't know if I've pronounced that right. Okay. Nicana, Timon, Ponemus, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Over the years, the devil has never changed his strategy, his tactics, or his weapons. He still uses them against the church. And having failed to overcome the church by persecution or corruption, he now tries distraction. A weapon he uses often with Christians today. Why would distraction be so dangerous? Because if the devil could preoccupy the apostles with social administration, which is essential in the church, and it's a very important work, but this was not their calling. The apostles would not neglect their God-given responsibilities to pray and to preach and so this would leave the church without any defense against false doctrine. Verse 1 says the number of the disciples was increasing as there was excitement in church growth but there was a problem the Grecian Jews among them complained against their great Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the Jerusalem church members were complaining against the apostles who received the relief money and were therefore expected to distribute it equally. Uh, in the previous chapter, verse, uh, chapter 4, verses four, 34 and 35, it says there was no needy persons among them. From time to time, people brought, they, they sold their lands and their houses and they brought the money before the apostles' feet. 
and it was distributed to people who had need. I think this was the relief money. So it doesn't tell us the problem was deliberate. It could have been the cause of poor administration or supervision. But the complaint concerned the uh, welfare of the widows. And God's heart was always to defend the widows. Assuming that they were unable to work and, and, all, <clears throat> and had no relatives to support them, <clears throat> the church had accepted the responsibility and a daily distribution of food was made to them. But there was a language and culture barriers because in the Grecian Jews and the Hebraic Jews. There'd always been um, rivalry between these two groups in Jewish culture, but the tragedy is that their differences were causing deep problems in the church. And Jesus came to break down those barriers of culture and language he did that by his death and had abolished them. So the issue was more than cultural tension. The apostles discerned a deeper problem. Organising the distribution and settling the complaints was threatening to take up all the time and hinder them from the work which Jesus had specifically entrusted to them, which was preaching and teaching. But notice what they didn't do. They did not ignore the problem. The apostles gathered all the disciples together to share the problem. They said it wouldn't be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word in order to wait on tables. They knew not to be distracted from their obedience to their calling. It was their priority task to pray and preach and teach the word of God. To protect the church from false doctrine which was going around at that time. The ministry of the word without prayer is unlikely to bear fruit. So the apostles do not neglect the problem. They do not see it as unimportant. And they do not regard social work as inferior to pastoral work. They made a proposal to the church. Verse 3 and 4 says, Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the Word. And this proposal pleased the whole group. The church saw the wisdom of the apostles' plan. In verse 5, 6, and 7, we, we, it says they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit, Philip, of Chorus, Nicana, Timon, Parnemus, and Nicholas. And they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. And so what happens? The word of God spread and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. <clears throat> Knowing God's will in situations is vital for all of us. A vital principle is illustrated here 
which is important to the church today. It is that God calls all his people to ministry, that he calls different people to different ministries. Christian ministry is serving God and his people, and we all have different gifts and different callings. <coughs> Wherever God leads us, at work, at home, or in his church, there's many different ministries to which God calls his people. Christian ministry is not to be restricted only to church work. It affects our everyday life with everyday people in all situations. We're just going to read now from verse 8 to 15. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, did great wonders and miraculous signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freed men, as it was called. Jews of Cyrene and Alexandra, as well as the provinces of Sicilia and Asia. These men began to argue with Stephen, but they could not stand up against his wisdom or the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We've heard Stephen speak words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All were sitting in the Sanhedrin, looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like that face of an angel. <clears throat> Stephen made a great impact on the church Verse 3 says he was full of the spirit and wisdom. Verse 5 says they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Verse 8 says a man full of God's grace and power. Filled with the spirit and filled also with wisdom, faith, grace and power. He would have made a great impression on people's lives. Grace and power form a striking combination. Sweetness and strength in his character. Grace shows a gracious Christ-like character. While his power was seen in the great wonders and miraculous signs which he did among the people. And yet, in spite of all Stephen's outstanding qualities, his ministry provoked opposition from members of the synagogue of the freed men. The freed men were free sl freed slaves and their descendants because they'd been freed from slavery. They must have been foreign Jews who had now come to live in Jerusalem. These men began to argue with Stephen, but they didn't realise what a godly man they were opposing because they could not stand up against his inspired wisdom by which he spoke. This was a fulfilment of the promise of Jesus, that he would give his followers words and wisdom which their adversaries would, would be unable to resist or contradict. And then they secretly persuaded someone to lie about Stephen. They said, we've heard Stephen speaks words of blasphemy against Moses and against God. They stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin and produced false witnesses. 
The rumour which had been circulated was that Stephen had blasphemed against Moses and against God. And the false witnesses said, this fellow never stopped speaking against the holy place and against the law. This was an extremely serious accusation. There was nothing more sacred to the Jews and nothing more precious than their temple and their law. The temple was a holy place, the sanctuary of God's presence, and the law was holy scripture, the revelation of God's will. So to speak against Ava was to speak against God, or in other words, to blaspheme. The false witnesses said, we've heard him say this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. So what did Jesus say about the temple and the law? First, he said he would replace the temple, not destroy it. False witnesses had testified. We heard him say, I'll destroy this man-made temple and in three days build another, not made by man. But the people hearing this thought, he meant it literally. They said it's taken four to six years to build this temple and you're going to raise it up in three days. But the temple he has spoken of was his body both his resurrection body, which was raised to life on the third day, and also his spiritual body, the church, which will take the place of the material temple. So Jesus spoke of himself as God's new temple replacing the hold. And Jesus boldly declared that one greater than the temple is here. So in the past, the people came together to me to the temple to meet God. But in the future, the meeting place with God will be Jesus himself. And Jesus said that he will fulfill the law. He was accused of disrespect for the law. But the scribes and Pharisees did not understand him. Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus gave his life for us that would fulfill all priesthood and sacrifice. He became the final priest and the final sacrifice. There will never be the need for another. There is one mediator between us and God, and that is Jesus Christ. We find our fulfillment in him alone. Jesus was and is himself the replacement of the temple and the fulfillment of the law. So Stephen was teaching much the same as Jesus taught. The false witnesses accused him that Jesus of Nazareth would destroy the temple and change the law. They were speaking of Jesus negatively and destructively. But Stephen was really preaching Jesus positively and saying that Jesus is the one in whom that all, the Old Testament foretold is fulfilled in him, including the temple, and the law. And it's at this point, in verse 15, that all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. It's interesting that they shall see his face shining like an angel, because that's exactly what Moses' face was like when he came down from Mount Sinai with the law. That's the Ten Commandments. So God was showing both Moses' ministry 
and the law and of, uh, of the law, the ministry of the law, and Stephen's interpretation of it had his approval. God's blessings on Stephen is evident throughout. The grace and power of his ministry, his faith and wisdom, his shining face were evident that God's favour was on him. And just like Stephen, we must focus on Jesus, his life, death and resurrection, because they all have saving significance. The gospel is good news for everyone. Jesus died for our sins and was raised to life. And we have a choice. He promises to those who respond to him the forgiveness of sins to wipe out the past and the gift of the Holy Spirit to make us new people. Freedom to be the people God made us to be. Jesus is with us through the Holy Spirit. There's only one way we can be right with God. Believe in Jesus Christ and put our trust in him. Because salvation is found in no one else.